I must say at the outset, it's a real honor to be invited to come to Medicine Sans Frontier to share my thoughts on humanitarian innovation. Yours is an organization that I see as perhaps the exemplar amongst all those working in the humanitarian innovation space and in the humanitarian space more generally. So as a result, when Pete asked me to come and speak to you, I felt a little bit like being asked to take a consignment of coal to Newcastle, I think is the British phrase. <laughs> the equivalent US phrase, I think, is taking ice to the Eskimos. Anyway, I Googled this particular phenomenon before my talk, and I discovered in our wondrous, multifaceted global economy, there's some really truly mind-boggling manifestations of taking coal to Newcastle. There's a Scottish firm that sells pizzas to Italy. There's a firm in Cambridge, Massachusetts that sells manga films to Japan. And this is my favorite one. There's an Icelandic retailer that sells curries to South India. <laughs> so, so I might be bringing coals to Newcastle, but at least I'm in good company. So what I want to talk about today is why and how we might need to think uh, differently about humanitarian innovation. And the need for approaches that put pe the power of people, the power of human beings at the center and what such approaches might look like. But before I do that, I want to highlight some of the hurdles that humanitarian initiatives face at the present time that we might need to overcome better if we're going to be successful in our endeavors. I want to talk about examples of innovators working in a whole range of different crisis settings, uh, not just in the humanitarian, but in military, in government settings, and so on, who successfully jumped or are in the process of jumping these hurdles. And I want to close with some ideas for what we might need to do to jump these hurdles more consistently and frequently. And pose the question, where do we want to see humanitarian innovation in the future? But before that, I want to talk to you all about the relationship between stress and creativity. And I want to ask you all a question. Who's better at being creative? Is it a stressed person or is it a relaxed person? Can I have a show of hands? Who thinks it's a stressed person? Who thinks it's a relaxed person? Who doesn't know? Who's feeling a bit stressed about the question? <laughs> but I, I want to give you an answer by asking you to imagine me just before I stepped onto the stage and came into this room. Imagine me pacing the corridors outside in the Royal Society of Medicine, my palms damp. Imagine me hearing my pulse in my ears, boom, rush, boom, rush, boom, rush. Imagine Pete coming to say hello and my mouth being too dry to actually articulate anything that I quickly, hello. Sorry, sorry about that, Pete. But if you're outside of me, you might have told me to calm down, be relaxed, you'll be fine. But this won't have necessarily helped. What usually happens when we feel like this uh, before stressful situations is people tell us to feel calm and they don't actually help. What I try and remember to do is to tell myself I feel excited. It sounds really simple, but it's a very, it can lead to a really strange and sudden shift. The, dr the racing heart, the dry mouth, the sweat, all change from being symptoms of anxiety to being symptoms of stimulation. Suddenly, I start to feel energized by the challenge rather than depleted by the major threat you all obviously pose to me. Uh, actually, this is based on research. This isn't just some kind of self-help Bible stuff. Researchers at the University of Pennsylvania prove that you can use mantras such as I feel excited to your advantage when you're doing something stressful. They put volunteers in a whole variety of stressful situations, uh, singing karaoke in front of strangers, doing math tests under pressure, speaking to their boss. And they wore heart monitors, and they could see their heart rate on the monitor during the task. Beforehand, the they divided the group into thirds. One group said, I feel anxious. One group said, I feel calm. And one group said, I feel excited. And the excited group felt more confident and also performed far better than the other two. Because saying, I feel calm, is actually a patent lie because it contradicts the symptoms you're feeling. But it's plausible to say, I'm excited, because the symptoms are almost identical. By saying, I'm excited, the, uh, the subjects were conjuring up a new mental context, which changed one emotion of anxiety into another of excitement. But why did it actually make them perform better? Because they felt they were taking on a challenge rather than facing a threat. And that sets up a series of changes to the actual chemistry of the brain. Saying, I feel excited, is part of the software of the mind, but it can change the way that our brain chemistry works. This challenge mindset actually puts your brain into what's called an approach mode. And this increases dopamine activity, which focuses your attention, sharpens you mentally, and that gives you a biochemical boost that then sharpens your performance. So in fact, reinterpreted in this way, stress becomes a source of positive energy and performance, and it aids performance in a whole variety of settings. And that's because a key component of stress is the neurotransmitter, and I'll try and get this right, uh, norepinephrine, which, like many of the brain's chemical messengers, has an inverted U-shape, as shown here. And this, this actual experiment, the related analysis, is the core of an argument set up by the British psychologist and neuroscientist called Ian Robertson in his brilliant book, The Stress Effect. And in it, he builds on the findings of the yerkes dodson experiments of the earliest 20th century, which first identified this inverted U-curve in performance. 
uh, relating stress to performance. And what Robertson does is he shows that in a whole variety of settings, our performance at created problem solving actually increases with stress up to an optimal point. Too much or too little stress causes us to underperform, but in the Goldilocks spot in between the two lies the spot of optimal performance. So when I say I feel excited, my interpretation pulls my norepinephrine levels back from their too high levels, back to the peak of the inverted U sweet spot. And the right levels, norepinephrine, actually has remarkable properties in the brain. It acts as sort of fertilizer. It grows new connections between neurons and even new brain cells. Now, what's becoming clear from the work of Robertson and others is it's not just the hardware of the brain, but how it interacts with the software of our minds that determines our sweet spots. Our thoughts our, and ideas, our fear of fear, is a key driver of stress. And at the stream, the way we think and the chemistry of the brain can act as an unrelenting vicious cycle that pushes us well beyond the sweet spot. Clearly, the sweet spot will vary for different people facing different problems in different situations. And by extension, your optimal point of stress versus your performance will be different to mine, all other things being equal. And there are four main factors that Robertson identifies. One is the subjective complexity of the task or challenge at hand. So I will find something more complex than Pete. In some settings, Pete will find it more complex than me. There's that subjective complexity determines the, how stressful we, stressed we get. Our perceptions of stress are also really critical. The social context within which we operate, and whether or not uh, we have a setting in which we collectively manage stress matters a great deal. And finally, skill and personality, how well we are able to manage stress as individuals, how, how much self-belief we have, where we might sit on the spectrum between creative and how we perceive ourselves as creative individuals. Uh, I don't have time to go into detail on these, but I can do so in Q&A, but the key lesson is, while the technical aspects of the challenges we face do matter, how we balance stress and creativity is as, if not more, influenced by human and social factors than they are by technical factors. And this is a part of a new scientific movement, bringing neuroscience and psychology and changing our understanding of the balance between pressure and creativity. And while this kind of rebalancing is necessary in all parts of human life, I want you to keep this concept of the optimal point of creativity in mind, because I think it's, we've got really obvious relevant fa uh, uh, relevance for, for the work we do in humanitarian innovation. And it presents both the opportunity for us in terms of how we work in humanitarian innovation, but also a lens to think about how we might do things better. Because I think to date, our effort has been largely focused on technical side of innovation and not really enough on the human or the social side. So having presented that, let me move on now to talk about some of the hurdles that we encounter in humanitarian innovation. So what do we face as a humanitarian community, not just MSF, the community as a whole working in the innovation space? These are the hurdles that I feel we need to overcome. They're based on research that I've done and as others have done. And they are hurdles, so forgive me if they seem overly critical. And they're not necessarily a comprehensive list, and I'm sure you'll have your own versions, but these are the ones that I think are most important. The first is system proliferation. So over the past 10 years, since the first study on humanitarian innovation was published, I think the humanitarian innovation movement has reinforced the tendency to focus on new tools and systems and left changing behaviors and attitudes behind. So once upon a time, maybe in the early noughties, we had masses of reports that no one read. And now we risk having a whole host of tools and applications that no one uses. Um, some of you all know this. This is a map of just a few of the mobile health monitoring projects in Uganda in 2013. Only about half of these were humanitarian in nature. Um, it was led to uh, the U Ugandan government taking an unprecedented step, a step of actually banning all digital health projects because of the sheer proliferation and confusion this was causing. And this is something that we can see across the humanitarian space. The result is we're seeing a large number of methods and approaches that cannot be shared outside original context and outside the original programmatic setting. It almost seems as they have been struggled for years, for decades, to move away from cookie-cutter approaches to humanitarian aid we now risk going in the opposite direction. We have these new technologies proliferating, and organizations are pursuing tailored systems for a whole host of different challenges. And it's, it's not especially effective, as the Uganda government showed. We also see quite a lot of unhealthy competition. The ideas of open innovation, which are now taking off in the private sector, haven't really helped us to be more collaborative in this space, despite open innovation being part of the grander promise of humanitarian innovation. In fact, I observe a pronounced, almost accepted lack of collaboration, 
different organizations have their own innovation unit. Sometimes different countries within organizational movements have their own innovation unit. And every humanitarian player plows their own separate innovation furrow, often with quite a lot of replication. And so what we see is a whole host of institutionally branded innovations to crisis response. It becomes advantageous for humanitarian organizations to say, this is our flagship SMS. UNICEF has one, Oxfam has one, Save the Children has one. They have a few signature technologies that communicates their branding. And they use this to aggressively pursue fundraising and programming goals. And the communication of these innovations therefore lends itself more to marketing than to research and development. Innovation is more led by the marketing side of the system than by the innovation evidence-based side of the system. And I think this has led to a dysfunctionally competitive approach to humanitarian innovation. Now, of course, you do need some competition in order to identify challenges and make sure you get the right solutions. But the institutionally centered approach risks the replication that's the part of the wider malaise of the sector. And it runs counter both to the principles of humanitarian aid and also the latest thinking on innovation from the private sector. And this actually is one of the real barriers to humanitarian innovations reaching scale. It's not because they're not effective, it's because they slam into institutional interests and the not made here syndrome, so I'm not going to use it syndrome. The next challenge is expert postures. Experts, whether they're humanitarian, innovation-based, technologies, medical, they come with their strong positions and preconceptions. And these are often based on flawed or imperfect understandings of, of the challenges that we face, especially in operational settings. They might be based on slightly misguided understandings of what innovation needs and possibilities are. And because we are so many communities in the humanitarian space, that what we tend to do is develop our own specific sub-community narratives about what the actual humanitarian need is. So as a resu result, we tend to solve the problem we see. Medics solve the problem they see. Digital fakes solve the problem they see. Fundraising people solve the problem they see. And they please us and they please our immediate stakeholders, but they don't necessarily match up to the realities on the ground. The next issue is what I call the digital deluge. And every single humanitarian challenge you can think of somewhere, anywhere in the world, is somewhere being dealt with by someone developing an app. Um, as a chair of the Humanitarian Innovation Fund, over seven years, over 50% of the applications to the fund were digital in nature. And they're often the least thought through and the least focused on humanitarian needs. And I think that instead of, as Marie Antoinette famously said about starving French peasants who wanted bread, let them eat cake, we now seem to be saying, let them eat data. And we seem to have gone from this situation of not enough data to being overloaded with data. And every app that we develop generates more data. And there's this assumption that data is just somehow down the road going to get used by humanitarian decision makers. But we actually have a profound lack of capacity to analyze and use the data. And we find it very hard to know how to verify it for objectivity or compare it. So as a result, the apps generate data. It looks very nice. You can put it in a fundraising report. You can put it on the front cover of The Economist, if you like. But it doesn't actually generate much for us. And what I think we've gone is from weak, non-existent data to weak, big data. Some of this can be analyzed to generate insights for decision makers, but it seldom happens real time in a way that can really operate in form operations. Um, and I think there's a whole range of um, issues. So when data is used, it can lead to faulty thinking, misguided responses, misleading reporting results. It can give a false sense of reality to senior managers who are far from the field and don't actually know what's going on. There are numerous examples recently of quite high profile of disregard for the rights and privacy of data affected communities. There's quite a few incidents of that. And while there's a lot of talk of big data in the humanitarian innovation, uh, in the future of the humanitarian sector, and I think there is a lot of promise. I think the reality more closely resembles the quip by the economist Dan Ariely, who said, big data is a bit like teenage sex. Everyone talks about it. Nobody really knows how to do it. Everyone thinks everyone else is doing it, so everyone claims they're doing it themselves. <laughs> um, new tools and old paradigms. Innovation reliance can actually serve to re reinforce existing mindsets, cultures, and approaches. The, the classic example with uh, in innovation studies is Henry Ford saying, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse, not a car. And I think actually much humanitarian innovation has been within the confines of existing assumptions, existing operating models, existing stakeholders. We're not on the whole doing double loop learning that asks why are we doing these things and how can we do this better? We're rigidly sticking to 
are, we aren't saying, are we doing the right things? We're saying, are we doing things right? And as a result, our efforts tend to be more limited. They're much more about incremental adjustments. They're, if Henry Ford came along, he would say, you've basically got a whole series of faster horses. Um, innovation cliffs. This is another major hurdle. I think most of humanitarian innovations end their lives a bit like this, falling dramatically off the end of a funding cliff. And the complaints from those involved say a lack of resources, a lack of belief, a lack of commitment. But actually, what happens is that you get these lovely processes which say you need to recognize a problem, you need to analyze it, you need to develop a solution, you need to test it, then you need to implement it. But very few ideas actually go down all the way through the pipeline. A research which we did back in 2015 identified that innovation spend of bilateral agencies, obviously not that relevant to MSF, but it came in at less than 0.01% of the overall humanitarian budget. But that isn't actually the issue. The issue is the innovation budgets in private sector organizations are used to reorient the rest of the budget. So if you have 5% on innovation, you know that in the future, that 5% could transform the other 95% of the way your business operates. That's the point of having an innovation budget. But the challenge in the humanitarian sector is our budget doesn't have that flexibility <coughs> built in. It's not reoriented towards changing the way that we do things. So you can spend as much as you like on the humanitarian innovation side. If it doesn't have clear pathways into changing the way you do the rest of your business, it's going to be really problematic. We dismiss end users. We have a continued tendency to Chris crises impacted communities down the road in the hope that someone else will pick up the ball and no one ends up doing it. And in our evaluations, we say the same thing we've said for the last 30 years, we should have engaged more with communities. And we need to just work harder at doing it. Uh, and in the rush towards humanitarian innovation, there's not been nearly enough emphasis on actors in developing countries, whether it's communities themselves, whether it's civil society, whether it's private sector, and government bodies. And, it's not, and there's a whole range of related issues. It's not just their engagement with, with the systems we build, which we assume will be infinitely available, they will be infinitely av available and infinitely compliant. But there's also issues of access to technology, selection, voice and representation, ethics and risks. And the importance of not just engagement, which we talk a lot about, but empathy is really critical. User-centered design in the private sector talks a lot about empathy. And I wonder how much we actually spend time thinking about empathy with disaster-affected communities when, we, when, we, when we're thinking about innovation. Now, actually doing this, gratifyingly, doesn't require importing a whole series of new tools from the private sector, because we've got a whole range of participatory tools at our fingertips. I think the real mystery of user-centered design with effective people is not how to do it, but why so few humanitarian innovations have done so. And I'll be giving some examples of people that actually tried to address this issue a little bit later. The final hurdle I want to talk about is, um, and this is one of the best images I've <laughs> Um, it is a genuine one as well. <laughs> Context will have its revenge. We have an institutionalized, almost legitimized lack of attention to contextual factors. The history of humanitarian aid is largely one of flawed attempts to cut and paste new ideas into context with little attention to how they actually fit into them. And the current efforts in humanitarian innovation haven't been immune to these established cultural and organizational norms within aid. We don't pay attention to infrastructure, to local availability of resources, to training, to capacity. We often forget that simpler is better. We tend to treat existing methods and new approaches as all our com uh, competitors rather than complements. A really good example, most people in developing countries use radio as their most widespread technology. When we go with mobile phones, we don't think about, well, how can we combine mobile phones with radio? There's some really good examples of people that do that, but actually we should be doing that as a matter of course instead of just going in with our smartphones and saying, this, this is going to change your lives. And context will eventually come to bite us on the backside, proverbially speaking. <laughs> so these are some big hurdles for us all, and there may be more. And some of these may need to change over time as we learn more. But my aim isn't to be negative, but to be really clear-headed about what we need to navigate and overcome. And as the O-line says, I used to be scared of hurdles, but I got over them. Um, sorry, <laughs> you can blame my seven-year-old son for that one. Um, I blame him for a lot of things that you don't know, don't worry. Uh, the problem is we don't actually appear to be learning how to jump these hurdles. Instead, we just seem to repeatedly crash into each one as we go into an, each new innovation project. And this is in part because I don't think we're being especially open and transparent about what we're learning. As usual, Dilbert has a cartoon that sums up this situation. I hope you can all read this. 
Um, I apologize if you feel like 15 drunken monkeys is too close to comfort as an analogy for our sector. But I think there is something here about just how we present what we're doing in the innovation space to the wider world compared to how we're actually doing it. So one of the first, so one of the first starting points for me in starting research on my new book was to refer to research in this area. And research in this area does exist. And it starts with a study I led back in 2008, which has just been described as a foundational text for the movement, something I like to repeat as often as possible, obviously. Um, but the research speaks to many of these challenges. And I wonder, but I wonder how much of it's actually being used to change the way we do humanitarian innovation. Much of the research has ended up being aspirational rather than operational. And it's seldom, if ever, used to assess and evaluate programs and to apply lessons. For example, in the very first study, we said, we recommended humanitarian innovation needs to be open and non-competitive by default. And today, there's innovation competition even between different country offices of the same international organizations. So I wonder how evidence-based we are in reality when we do this work. I don't think there's really enough strategic learning, and that strategic learning isn't really feeding into how we do innovation. And therefore, we're not really being able to clearly articulate how our ambitions in this space match up to humanitarian objectives. There are some notable exceptions to this lack of learning. Um, the, the ALNAP report, more than just luck, if you haven't read it, I'd really urge you to do so, because I think it really talks about the challenges in a clear-headed way. And it deepens our understanding of the success factors for humanitarian innovation. It talks about greater attention to the how of humanitarian innovation, not just the what. It talks about the fact that humanitarian responders need support that speaks to their specific capabilities and their interests, and their ab ability to work and be creative in crisis settings speaking back to that point about balancing stress and creativity. That we actually need to urgently improve our culture for innovation, that we can be innovative in the humanitarian sector if leaders give us the space to do that and encourage us to do that. And that culture is something that we all need to contribute to. And we don't really think that much about our cult organizational cultures, I think, think. And we obviously need much greater attempts to address problems from the perspective of affected people themselves. This is a quote from John Besson, who's one of the leading UK experts in on innovation, and he's been instrumental in shaping the way innovation works in the humanitarian sector, and was actually part of the chair of the Humanitarian Innovation Fund with me for a number of years. And he said that while humanitarian innovations might be rich in goodwill, they often lack the core skills needed to turn an idea into something that real, creates real sustainable value. And the challenge is, how do you learn about the discipline, the skills of innovation, and how to manage it under particularly difficult conditions and limited resources with a lack of control? And in my view, this, this actually is central, and it m reinforces the point I was making earlier about the human social sides of humanitarian innovation. We're simply not thinking enough about the, the importance of people, and we often undervalue the potential of our people to, to lead and undertake innovation processes. But this is not the way things have to be. So in, in my research for my new book, which is called Crisis Innovators, I've looked at crisis innovators in a whole range of different settings, and I've looked at it historically as well as in the modern day. I've looked at it close to home in areas like humanitarian, in emergency services, in disease response, and I've also looked at it in more further afield, in military and in space. And building on the work of innovation scholars, uh, Clayton Christensen, who wrote the work, uh, book in The Innovator's Dilemma, I try to focus on the key behaviors that optimize the creative impulse within people and within organizations. Now, I've identified a number of skills that I think are especially essential for the innovation in different crisis settings. And I've mapped them to 50 different case studies in different contexts and different time periods. People that have responded to crises in creative and innovative ways. And some of these, as I show, have gone on to make remarkable changes in the world as a result. And they're challenges, challenges of people who are able to constructively challenge and question the status quo. Crafters, they're people who are really deeply steeped in how things work and are able to come up with novel solutions. Combiners are people who work across different technical areas and they're able to bring together ideas from those areas in a systematic way. Collaborators are people that are remarkable at network building. This is if I was going to be anything in this space, that would be me. Corroborators, not in the legal sense, but in the, in the evidence based sense of people who are really thirsty for data and information. And conductors, not in the bus sense, but in the orchestration sense, people that are able to bring all these things together. Let me talk you through these quickly now. And this is someone that might be known to you. A good example of a challenger, Steve Collins. Steve Collins, a doctor and an aid worker, and he was running a nutrition program in Liberia in the late 1990s. And he was well aware of the job at hand. He was only in his mid-30s at the time, but he was an expert in tackling malnutrition by establishing therapeutic feeding centers, these large centers where malnourished patients were admitted for an average of 30 days. 
In Somalia in 1992, it was put into charge of the first adult feeding centers anywhere in the world since the Second World War and the liberation of the death camps. And he actually published his work in the prestigious Nature Journal. I think he was one of the youngest people at the age of 29, perhaps the youngest person to have had a single authored uh, piece in, in Nature up, up until that point. In 1996, in Liberia, there was a cholera outbreak amongst the patients that he was dealing with and the, and the communities around them. And it led him to rethink this way of working, because essentially when he set up a th therapeutic feeding centre, people come from miles around, they create informal communities. The, the famous images of Ethiopia from the 1980s were people that had brought their children to the feeding centres and they created an informal, informal settlement around them. And that's what led to the cholera outbreak. And this to him, as he put it, brought home to me the danger of people bringing people together in this way to, in feeding centres. There had to be a better way. I knew this would come from engaging people better looking at their strengths rather than trying to impose solutions on them. And this is exactly what he did. So using the latest nutritional products, Steve and colleagues at Ballard International developed a new means of treating malnutrition that proved five times more effective than conventional methods at a fraction of the cost. And today, following extensive roll-up, a lot of opposition from organisations like MSF and UNICEF and others that were really supporting the previous way of doing things, but it was tested in a whole range of different settings. The reason it was able to be tested is because the Ethiopian government banned therapeutic feeding centres in 2002, and he was therefore able to go in with an alternative that was seen as ethical. And it's now been claimed by the WHA as being at the forefront of dealing with malnutrition of the world, uh, around the world. And that something like the death rates of treatments have dropped from something in the region of 30 to 40% mortality rates down to less than 10%. And as a result, it's become the standout illustration of humanitarian innovation. But it's the human story that I want to focus on. It's, it's not just what he achieved, but it's recognition that, the, that there had to be a better way of doing things. And even though his expertise was embedded within the existing approach. And this is really at the heart of the challenger mentality. Now, obviously, many of us have had this experience in operational response, but few of us have the time or the space or the resources or the institutional space to do something about it. As a result, a lot of challenge mentality doesn't really go anywhere. And I think we need to find a way of channeling that better. So channel, uh, challenges like Steve, they constructively question the status quo, their, their iconoclasts, and that they're willing to burn the icons, literally. They redefine problems in new ways and from new perspectives. And they're willing to put their own reputation and status on the line. And what was especially important with Steve was the degree of empathy and engagement with communities, that for him, it was about the plight of parents and their ability and their capability to look after children better using what, what in medical terms, was an outpatient system for dealing with malnutrition, was essentially a community-based, home-based approach. Um, this is Caetano Doria. He's a professor at the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Victoria. He's a great example of a crafter. He works on the interface of environment and public health, and he works with Oxfam and UNICEF and a whole range of others. And I'm sure a number of you work on water quality. Uh, many of you will know there are important trade-offs to be struck between quality and quantity of water. The transmission of water and excreta-related diseases is as likely to be to the lack of sufficient quantities of water for domestic and personal hygiene as to contaminated water sources. But what he's discovered over years of research is it's key to get a safe water supply that's both free of pathogens technically, but it's also aesthetically and culturally appropriate. Like it's visually clear, it doesn't have a taste, it doesn't have an odour. And that, that cultural appropriate, appropriateness varies considerably between different communities and cultures. And he found that the vast majority of purification, purification kits simply didn't pay attention to, they weren't technically compatible to start off with field, with field conditions. There were often very innovative approaches developed by the private sector and then imported into the humanitarian sector. And they were fine in lab conditions, but they weren't very effective. But they were, didn't generally necessarily produce water that was culturally appropriate. So what he did over a number of years was to steep himself in humanitarian realities, to try and better understand how communities used and perceived water and the kinds of processes that could be utilised. And he, based on this deep analysis, he actually found a number of features of conventional water treatments that could be made better use of. And he worked with Oxfam and UNICEF to develop a, a, a particular approach which brought together um, two aspects. One's um, inclined plane settling and coagulants. One's chemical process to essentially gather particles in, in um, contaminated water and, and filter it quicker. And one's a particular origami style approach that enables you to filter them. And this led to a um, whole range of different uh, applications, made, made to be in South Sudan. 
uh, working with a local government body in charge of water infrastructure, and it showed that it's this what was called an inclined plate settler succeeded in de delivering a measurable improvement over other water treatment systems, both in terms of sufficient acceptable quality, maximum quantity over time, and cost. And the tools actually won awards for its potential to contribute to water security. And it's one of the ones we supported in the Humanitarian Innovation Fund. Now, crafters like Doria exhibit some common features. They have a deep engagement with underlying processes and patterns that are faced by, by disaster-affected communities. They have an obsession not just with their particular area, but not just with the functional side of things, but also the social, the emotional, the behavioural side, the understanding that clean water goes beyond technical to the cultural. Um, they, and they use this understanding to craft and adapt novel solutions to match emergency contexts and social situations. Combine is a third type, and I'm going to take a step back into more recent history. This is UU2. Does anyone know who she is? Anyone heard of her? Okay, one. Okay. So this is, imagine 1967. Only one government research project was supported by Chairman Mao in China. It's called Project 523. And it was a result of a personal request from the Vietnamese Premier Ho Chi Minh to essentially keep his allied troops combat ready during the ongoing war with the United States. Vietnamese soldiers at that time had a saying, we're not afraid of the American imperialists, but we are afraid of malaria. malaria. And the imperialists were far from immune. In 1964, malaria-related casualties amongst the US forces was five times greater than the casualties from direct combat. And the following year, nearly half of all American military personnel, 800,000 men, were infected. So as a result, malaria became a top priority for dealing with for both sides. In America, it was the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research in DC that launched the hunt for anti-malaria drugs. And it launched a massive investment, thousands and thousands of researchers, huge, and they tested a quarter of a million different possible drugs. The Chinese project had 600 scientists. It was a fraction of the resource on the US side. It launched on the 23rd of May, 1967, which gave it the project name, Project 523. And although none of them knew it at the time, the project would something, be something of a protection against the persecutionary zeal of the Cultural Revolution. A malarial arc for scientists and researchers is what someone described it as. By 1969, the project had looked at thousands of possible drugs with no success, and the Walter Reed on the US side also had no success. And at this point, the Chinese government brought in the Academy of Traditional Chinese Medicine, and Yu Yu Tu, who was a young herbologist there at the time, and she was appointed director of the overall project because she understood both sides, having had some medical training. And her project started with a four-month trip to Hainan, a tropical island at the southernmost point of China. And when she was there, when she returned, she was deeply affected by the plight of the people there. And she, she said, I saw a lot of people who are in the late stages of malaria, and those kids died very, very quickly. I really felt I had to do something about this. It gave a really deep sense of empathy and purpose and motivation, which was linked to the people that she met. What was essential from UU2's perspective was that it would have two wings. It would have the traditional medicine, but the herbology side and the biochemical side, uh, biomedical side. One group was tasked to uh, test and synthesize drugs, and the other was tasked to examine traditional Chinese medicines. And the different teams had to constantly combine ideas and constantly come together in order to smash ideas together. So one, imagine one team screening ancient medical texts and the other working on chemical isolation of different act, active ingredients. And there were more than 2,000 different preparations that were tested by UU's team. And eventually, there was a pl plant called sweet wormwood that was identified. And it was described in a centuries-old document. And the active ingredient was discovered by UU2 after a long process of trial and error and cross-team work. And it was synthesized by Project 523 and is now known as Artis Artemisinin. Um, which I'm sure many of you will know. And it showed uh, promising tests in mice and monkeys, and UU2 actually volunteered to be the first human recipient. She said, I'm the leader, I should take responsibility. And it had no ill effects, so they tried it on infected laborers in Hainan, and the symptoms disappeared within two days. Her role was actually not widely publicized um, at the time. The research was eventually published in the 70s, and it came to work thanks to the work of the WHO and at the Walter Reed. Um, and there were numerous tests and large-scale production efforts, and Arta Missinin moved to the centre stage of the global effort against research and malaria, thanks actually to the work of NSF in testing and applying in a whole range of settings out quite far from where it was being applied. And today, although there is issues around resistance to Arta, Arta Missinin, the chance of dying from malaria in severe cases are half from 1 in 5 to 1 in 10. The number of deaths have reduced by 75%, and that's a, from around 2 million deaths globally in 2000, 
to 500,000 in 2013. And in 2015, EU2 became the first Chinese national to win a Nobel Prize for science. She shared the price of medicine. Um, and when she, actually, she's a very modest person, but what she, when she said, she said, uh, she, she was quoted saying, it was a bit of a surprise, but not too much of a surprise. <laughs> so combiners like EU2, they draw ideas across different fields and endeavors. They generate new associations, and they're really focused on combinations of different skills. And they engage in bricolage, what you might call Lego thinking. And again, the importance of empathy in creating shared goals and helping to navigate dramatic, dramatic crisis context was really critical. Collaborators, um, I'm just conscious of the time, and I've got a bit to go. Collaborators, um, um, shall I just keep going, Pete? OK, great, thank you. Collaborators, um, are perhaps appropriately, it's not an individual, but a team of people. This is the SPEED program in the Philippines. And this was developed after Typhoon Quetzal. This is the first ever mobile-based health surveillance system to go to national scale anywhere in the world. And I think it might still be the only one, actually. Um, but it was, it was after Typhoon Quetzal in 2009 and the world's biggest leptospiriosis outbreak in Manila, and it highlighted the need for better disease outbreak preparedness. And it was developed as an early warning system uh, for post-disaster situations to spot um, immediate potential disease outbreaks. And it used web-based data, web-based software that would get in data from mobile phones and, and handheld applications, and it enabled the transmission of syndromic disease surveillance information from primary reporting units at vacation centers to the health system up to the national level. And it was activated, it was actually designed by the government in collaboration with civil society and the private sector, but in collaboration with the humanitarian sector. And the emphasis across the consortium was that the actors had to build relationships with each other. They knew that if they just left it to the humanitarian sector, they would come up with a system that was basically lasted as long as the crisis response and then got forgotten. So they had to find a system that, where the baton could be passed on. And there was a central importance of building relationships with each other, with local governments, with community-based organizations. And it wasn't for this relational work, this system wouldn't have gone to national scale. And I think there's some really key lessons here around uh, basically the, the ecosystem. We have very few incentives within the system for actually doing this kind of system-wide work. Uh, and I think expecting this might be uh, asking emergency responders to try and help reform building codes. Uh, and I think a small thought experiment is quite useful here. If, had speed been developed solely by the humanitarian sector, one can imagine it would have been deployed once and forgo forgotten by the next emergency. Instead, it's a standing mechanism which is used e after every emergency. So collaborators like the Speed Group, they bring together different groups around shared goals and opportunities and gaps. And they identify win-win-win solutions. The private sector was involved here. They actually got resources from this. The government was involved. The WHO was involved. Humanitarians were involved. And I think everyone had to find a way of negotiating, uh, negotiating their wins in this process. And the key is drawing un unusual suspects who might not be seen as typically humanitarian. I think we have this notion that we in the humanitarian sector have uh, a monopoly on the term humanitarian. But I actually think we need to break that monopoly. I think anyone can be humanitarian in the right context. Um, the next example, I, I actually did originally have MSF here but the, um, as the corroborators par excellence. But I thought that would be a bit too much like trying to flatter you all. So I'm going to tell the story of Archie Cochrane, who's the so called father of um, evidence based medicine. Um, uh, and the Cochrane Collaboration for Randomized Controlled Trials is named in his honor. Um, and very quickly, he was, um, his experience during the war, he was, uh, he was in the Royal Army Medical Corps as a captain. He participated in military action where he was captured. And he spent the rest of the war years as a prisoner of war with a speciality of medical officer in a whole range of refugee camps. And this is where he performed one of the first ever medical trials using randomized methods. At the time, randomization and trials were mainly used in agriculture, not in medicine. And what, in le what led him to conduct the trial was this high end incidence of ankle edema of unknown or origin amongst the prisoners. And it, it developed edema even up to above the knee. So it was looking really quite grim. And he hypothesized that the underlying cause was vitamin uh, deficiency as um, the prisoners were provided with really scanty nutrition levels of around 500 calories per day. And he expressed his concerns to the German leaders of the camps, and they refused to help. And so he brought yeast in the form of Marmite and vitamin C supplements from the black market in the camp and selected a sample of prisoners, and he divided them into two. And he did, gave one group daily portions of yeast, and he gave the other group daily portions of vitamin C. 
and limited their water intake and measured the frequency of urination. And after four days, he said the yeast eating group had improved. And so he then went to the, wrote all this down and went to the German camps and they said, we need more yeast. And the German camp uh, managers rejected him and left him feeling really frustrated and furious. But then a young German doctor picked it up and said, look, we, the evidence is incontrovertible. If we don't supply vitamins to the prisoners, then it's a war crime. And so they got vitamin B12 and they supplied it and the prisoners uh, recovered and the incidence of pitting edema dropped dramatically. Now, he actually wrote about this later on and he talked about it as his first worst and most successful trial ever. Um, and I think it was quite interesting. I mean, it, it, was, uh, it, it can be thought to be both randomized and controlled. Um, at the time, RCTs were almost unknown to the medical community. His story of doing this was one of the things that actually inspired people in the 40s and 50s to start doing trials more effectively. So corroborators like, like uh, Archie Cochran, they test, observe, and gather data. They probe and explore things in systematic fashion through experiments. And they, they play a central role in making the case and advocating for change. The final example of, of the, the personality type that I want to talk about is the conductor. And here I want to talk about the Royal Victoria Hospital in Belfast. It's still to this day the largest hospital in Belfast. Um, and it was seen as being right on the forefront of the battle. And in 1969, when the trouble started, no one had seen a gunshot wound. And by 1973, it became a hub for the development of a whole range of groundbreaking techniques that would transform emergency medicine and military medicine around the world. And they met a whole range of different cha cha challenges. One was political, and they actually put in place a kind of humanitarian principle that they would treat all sides equally, whether they were perpetrators or victims, whether they were the army or the military or the paramedics or the people. They'd treat them all equally to get the best possible care. Nurse so Hanlon, who's the chief nurse, actually said, all we want to do is know is what happened in relation to the injuries. We're not interested in the politics. On the technical side, the research and teaching hospital there was bolted on to the A&E team, so they were able to take on board the kinds of injuries and ailments that are happening, and they had frontline staff directly leading to, directly involved in the development of new techniques, and it led to new techniques for everything from dealing with lung collapse of bomb victims, integrating dental filling techniques into cranial surgery using titanium cranioplasty, triage techniques which are still used today across hospitals in the UK and around the world, called the Rutherford techniques, named after the head of the A&E unit there. And it was a spirit of constructive engagement, but I think perhaps most important, there was a kind of emotional and social support led by Mary, uh, led by Sister Kate O'Hanlon. They drew upon this notion that we needed to be able to face up to the horror of the troubles with creativity rather than convention. As she wrote, there wasn't counselling, we coped because we were all together. You had porters and nurses and doctors and consultants and we would all talk together every day and there was a great team spirit. And she was instrumental in creating this environment in which this innovation could happen. Uh, William Rutherford, who was knighted subsequently and for running the department, actually said, the principles are very simple. You have to love everybody, you have to listen to everybody, and if in doubt, you do what Sister O'Hanlon tells you. <laughs> um, and conductors, they spot the trouble, problems, and they ensure they're channeled and addressed in appropriate ways. And they ensure there's a right balance of skills and sequence of skills. And they maintain a sense of mission. Um, all of this, to my mind, adds up to an argument for a, for a shift in how we think about humanitarian innovation. So my own mere culpa here, when I wrote the first study on humanitarian innovation, I wanted to make the case for, a, for make, investing more money in it. And in the sector, I knew that talking about people wasn't necessarily going to get us there. So I focused on a pro process-focused approach, and it seemed much more likely to attract attention and resources. And this kind of process was what we put forward. And this is what we essentially got lots of resources. We've got the Humanitarian Innovation Fund. We've got ideas to move through these different things and so on. But I, today, I'm convinced that if we're going to be successful, we need to rebalance this with a people-centered approach to how we think about innovation. It's, we can't think just about the processes of innovation in a, like it's a pipeline in a factory. We need to think about the skills and the capabilities and how we orchestrate them together, like, a, like the players of instruments in a band. And we need to think about our own role within that. The image of the lone innovator as is just one part of the We need to, in a way, democratize innovation across our sector and between our sector and those we seek to help. And again, I think a people-centered approach is really important here. So what would this look like in practice? So I think a few ideas. First of all, we need to operate from the affected community backwards and not from the agency forwards. 
We need to develop the capabilities to anticipate and interpret emerging needs and opportunities, and we need to respond to them not with technologies, but with empathy and with principles. We need to empower teams to make collective decisions based on a shared understanding of purpose and values, and importantly, with emotional openness between us to talk about the challenges that we're facing. And yes, we do need to adapt and continuously test a whole range of tools and possible ideas and models to ensure relevance. And we need to foster new kinds of partnerships and networks to achieve goals in a highly collaborative fashion. Let me quickly try and sum up what I've said. So there's been progress in humanitarian innovation and some non-trivial hurdles. There's more evidence-based learning is necessary and possible, but we have to remember that humanitarian innovation is much about the human and the social side as it is about the technical and the technological. And there's some great people and some great teams and some great examples and some emerging archetypes that might help us rebalance this approach. And I just want to close with just going back to the point that I started with. Um, but I think humanitarian innovation could be at its best a, a point towards the kind of professional and personal and institutional mindsets we need to have in place to work on humanitarian challenges both now and in the future. It's a way of furthering understanding, of opening up new ways of think, seeing and thinking, of unlocking our individual and collective capabilities in the face of destruction and devastation. Just to go back to the point about stress and creativity I started with, there are some downsides to stress, obviously. It can, it can lead to overstress. But the brilliant thing about this generation, this development, is that and across a whole range of problems, well-managed stress doesn't actually lower our creative abilities, it advances them. And there are a whole range of examples where successful innovators have been able to tap into this already without knowing about it. What the human focus does, it enables us to see constraints not as restrictions, but as a source of freedom. And I think we in the humanitarian community could see innovation as doing the same thing, freeing ourselves of dogma, and hopefully pointing the way to a new kind of humanitarian enterprise that should be the kind of thing we see in the 21st century. More open, more honest, more dynamic, more engaged, more networked, an enterprise we can point to with pride instead of discomfort. Thank you very much for listening.